Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining this NIOSH 50th anniversary science webinar, Behind the Science, Spotlight on NIOSH Intervention and Translational Research. My name is Paul Schulte and I'll be your host. We're delighted to have you participate in this NIOSH webinar. This is the last of the webinars uh, celebrating NIOSH's 50th anniversary. And it's fitting that the focus is on intervention and translational research, because this is the research that helps assure that the kinds of things that NIOSH does in its research and practice efforts actually make a difference. So without further ado, I'd like to set the stage in, in the next uh, three slides. Uh, oh, first of all, the obligatory disclaimer. Thank you. And then the next slide. I, oh, and I'd like to welcome our speakers. And we have five distinguished speakers today, Rebecca Guerin, Jay Collinette, Ted Teske, Scott Ernest, and Barbara Lee. And before each presentation, I will uh, introduce them uh, in more detail. And so uh, to set the stage, I'd like to uh, identify, uh, show you in this slide, uh, a perspective that will help uh, uh, frame what we're going to hear today. And this is a slide that shows uh, five eras of occupational safety and health. Uh, these, this is subjective. This is based on my reading of the uh, history and scientific literature. And these five eras uh, include foundational concepts, uh, basic uh, welfare and child labor concepts, uh, also uh, leading to the beginning of the ILO, which was critical in uh, global occupational safety and health, toxic chemicals and physical agents, stress management and productivity, and total worker health, well being, future of work, and sustainability. Now, there's three things to remember about this. NIOSH has spanned all uh, three of these uh, eras starting in uh, 1971. Secondly, when we think of occupational safety and health, we have to remember that this is a global field and we learn and collaborate with global partners, and we'll need to continue to do that in the future. And, and thirdly, if you look at the last uh, box here, the most contemporary box, the current box, you can see that the field is getting more complex and more diverse. And we're going to need uh, the kinds of efforts that you're going to see described or hear described in this webinar to address those needs. Next slide, please. The critical focus for today is shown in this slide. The engine of occupational safety and health is basic research as shown in the triangle. But it, the critical feature is, does it make a difference? Does it have an impact? Have we been able to take that information and implement it, put it into play? And that's what we're going to hear about, the science of how you study how well we put things into play, what are the best methods, how, we, how well and what are the best ways to make a difference. Next slide. And this builds on a history throughout NIOSH. Uh, in the 1980s, we had total quality management, which uh, aimed to improve impact by having continuous improvement. Then we move to the Nora era, and you're all familiar with that. It's a goal-driven approach so that we're doing the most important things. In the 90s, one of the goal areas and one of the critical areas was intervention effectiveness research. We're going to build on that today. And then finally, in 2004, the principle that really drives NIOSH activity that we want to put our research into practice. And so you're going to hear today, not so much about R2P, but how to study R2P, how to study the processes of R2P. And so I look forward today to today's presentation and I would like to do, uh, introduce the first speaker. And the first speaker is Dr. Rebecca Guerin. Dr. Guerin is a research social scientist and chief of the social science and translation research branch of the Division of Science Integration. 
Dr. Guerin also coordinates the NIOSH Safe, Skilled, and Ready Workforce Program and the NIOSH Translational Research Program. For more than 13 years, Dr. Guerin has been responsible for implementing, evaluating, and disseminating a program of research to integrate workplace safety and health skills uh, and, and training into secondary schools. The end goal of this is to reduce occupational health inequities among young workers. Dr. Guerin has applied expertise in dissemination and implementation science methods and approaches and is currently earning a graduate certificate in dissemination and implementation science from the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Rebecca. Thank you, Paul, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to speak with you about translational science at NIOSH, progress and opportunities. Next slide, please. So this is just a brief overview of my presentation. I'll talk very briefly about the research to practice gap in public health, then we'll look back at translational research at NIOSH. Then we'll talk a little bit about where implementation research fits in. I'll provide an example from the NIOSH Young Worker Research Program, and then we'll have an opportunity to highlight some future directions and opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. But first, for a little bit of background. Next slide. So according to the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, billions of US tax dollars are spent each year on research and hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on the delivery of health, healthcare, and public health interventions in clinical and community settings. However, relatively little is spent on research on the downstream end of the research continuum, focusing on how to move relevant research into sustained practice. The leaky pipeline that hinders the transfer of scientific knowledge to practice is depicted on the slide and is characterized by the 17 years it takes to turn just 14% of original research to the benefit of program recipients. Closing the gap between basic research and population health is a complex challenge and an absolutely necessary one to ensure that all people, including workers, benefit from substantial investments in science and public health. Next slide, please. So there are a number of gaps in bringing occupational health and safety research into sustained practice to benefit workers and communities. For example, according to research from Lucas and colleagues, only 17% of US fishing safety research has been adopted in workplaces to benefit workers. Reasons for these gaps are numerous and they include the complexity and diversity of US workplaces and workforces and the difficulty in accessing many work sites and workers as well as the lack of fit of interventions with the local context. Occupational safety and health leaders have therefore called for more adaptive, innovative, and transdisciplinary research. This includes approaches that speed translation for addressing the multi-level and interconnected real-world challenges of a rapidly changing global economy and workforce and global public health crises, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Translational science is a newer field emerging over the past 20 to 30 years that's concerned with identifying and advancing generalizable principles that hasten research translation. Or stated differently, it concerns generalizable research steps to take scientific discoveries from the lab to the work site and back again. Next slide, please. At NIOSH, one of the Institute's strategic goals is to promote safe and healthy workers through interventions, recommendations, and capacity building by transferring research findings, technologies, and information into practice. The need to enhance rigor, theory use, stakeholder engagement, and to increase the uptake of occupational safety and inter health interventions has been a longstanding topic of interest in the occupational safety and health community and at NIOSH. Going back here in this timeline, as Paul had mentioned, to intervention effectiveness research, the first and second decades of the National Occupational Research Agenda and the NIOSH R2P initiative. A 2009 report by the National Academies of Science and an external evaluation in 2014 articulated the need to advance translational research, defined then as strategies to translate research findings and theoretical knowledge to implementable practices and technologies in the workplace. The Translation Research Program, as Paul also mentioned, was established in 2016 
And in 2019, efforts began coordinated with the NIOSH Evaluation Capacity Building Plan to refine the vision for and expand the reach of the NIOSH Translation Research Program and align these efforts with those of other federal agencies. And I'll highlight just a few of those efforts throughout this presentation. Next slide, please. So translation research at NIOSH has been defined as activities ranging across the basic to applied continuum. Studies referred to as intervention research and translation research often overlap. NIOSH delineates the two in this way. Intervention research involves improving on existing interventions or developing new ones, whereas translation research involves studying generalizable processes for putting research outputs into sustained practice or use. Next slide, please. So how has translation, or also referred to as translational research, been conceptualized at NIOSH? Well, as depicted by the examples on this slide, the NIH translational pipeline has been adapted for occupational safety and health and for NIOSH to depict the stages of moving science from the lab to the work site and back again to improve the health, safety, and well-being of workers. There are many variations of this NIH pipeline model, but generally speaking, they include four to five translational stages. Next slide, please. So on this slide is a more recent adaptation of the translational pipeline for occupational safety and health. It illustrates the steps in moving research from the discovery phase in T0 to efficacy in T1 to effectiveness research in T2 to dissemination and implementation research in T3 to occupational safety and health practice and impact in the T4 stage. These latter stages are depicted by the red rectangle. An important note is that the stages are recursive and iterative. So information at a later stage informs research at earlier stages, and depending on the outcomes at any given time point, it may be necessary to go back to an earlier stage. Finally, as illustrated in the figure, for positive impact to be achieved, it's important to plan for dissemination and sustainability from the outset, and to engage stakeholders on an ongoing basis across all stages of the research continuum. The field of implementation science provides a toolkit of existing methods, models, and measures to advance our late stage translational research agenda at NIOSH and in occupational safety and health, including and perhaps especially in addressing complex future of work problems. Next slide, please. So implementation research, which we saw on the previous slide, occurs in the T3 stage of the translational continuum, is increasingly a focus of, uh, and an important fun function of academia and is a major priority for funding organizations and agencies, including the NIH, CDC, and others appearing on the slide, and internationally by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the World Health Organization. Going forward, there may be utility for NIOSH to adapt more universal terminology and definitions so that NIOSH researchers and practitioners can find implementation research resources and tools, as well as so that implementation researchers and practitioners from multidisciplinary fields understand more about NIOSH offerings in this area. Next slide, please. So how is implementation research defined? Broadly, it's the study of methods to promote the adoption and integration of evidence-based interventions into routine public health settings to improve population health and well-being. And why is it important for occupational safety and health? Well, applying implementation research methods to occupational safety and health and future of work challenges may reduce program costs, improve occupational safety and health outcomes, and increase health equity. An active implementation approach has been shown to speed up the translational pipeline in one estimate, moving 80% of research into practice in just three years. This is compared to the 14% of practice in 17 years we saw previously. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk a little bit about applying implementation research and science to young worker research at NIOSH. Next slide, please. So as noted on a previous slide, implementation research aims to generate generalizable knowledge about the processes of taking evidence-based interventions into sustained practice. But what do we mean by an intervention? Well, Brown and colleagues have conceived of evidence-based interventions in public health 
as being broadly defined as the seven Ps, which the NIOSH Translation Research Workgroup under the NIOSH Evaluation Capacity Building Plan activities has adapted, swapping out hills in their model for partnerships in our model as presented on this slide. And some general considerations of this model include the diversity of evidence and Ps at NIOSH, that the Ps interact with each other and are developed in a nonlinear manner. For example, a regulation could be an impetus for a NIOSH practice procedure or program, or it could be the result of one of these. Evidence development in the context of OSH evolves over time. It's challenging to determine what was the first discovery of the relevant evidence. Evidence might emerge from various fields to inform a solution. Multidisciplinary contributions to problem solving in occupational safety and health is very common. And finally, political, societal, and regulatory context is important in our field for shaping what is being addressed and how. Next slide. So we'll now look at an applied example of the seven Ps to the NIOSH Young Worker Research Program. So the problem of young worker injuries was identified through surveillance data um, as far back as 1990 and even previously with the General Accountability Office report or the GAO report, Child Labor Characteristics of Working Children. Young workers aged 15 to 24 years in the United States are injured sometimes fatally within certain high-risk industries at disproportionately high rates when compared to adult workers. And these injuries can have lifelong physical and mental health impacts. Some researchers, practitioners, and policymakers have argued for occupational safety and health training and education to be provided in schools so that all adolescents, before they enter the workforce or start that first job, have a grounding or a foundation in their worker rights, responsibilities, and risks. In France, for example, Researchers found that young workers who had received occupational safety and health education while at school reported two times fewer job-related injuries than young workers who had not received this education. Our stated principle is therefore that all young people and new workers should be equipped before they enter the workforce or start a new job with foundational competencies in occupational safety and health, such as the ability to identify hazards in the workplace and understand the best methods for controlling them, to understand their rights and responsibilities on the job and communicate effectively about problems in the workplace. We developed a theoretical fr framework at NIOSH articulating these essential knowledge, skills, and abilities, and we called it the NIOSH eight core competencies. Our practice is to deliver educational programs and training to equip young people and new workers with foundational competencies in occupational safety and health through school and other community-based settings. Our procedures include the dissemination and diffusion of knowledge products through NIOSH channels as well. The NIOSH Safe Skill Ready Workforce Program is the overarching effort that carries out this work with the help of our partners in labor, academia, and government. Our products include, among others, the evidence-based Youth at Work Talking Safety Curriculum that I'll talk about on the next slides. And finally, in terms of policies, project partners inspired to advance young workers' safety and health were instrumental in proposing and having legislation passed in Oklahoma and Texas, promoting the teaching of occupational safety and health in secondary schools in those states. In another example, the American Federation of Teachers passed a national resolution to promote young worker safety and health, and specifically the teaching of the NIOSH Young Worker curriculum throughout their AFT networks. Meanwhile, state and federal child labor laws and Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People Goals are drivers of and inputs to the NIOSH Young Worker Program. Next slide, please. So as mentioned on a previous slide, talking safety is the main vehicle at NIOSH for studying the delivery and integration of the NIOSH core competencies, primarily in schools. Today's talking safety is based on earlier work from NIOSH and its partners beginning in the 1990s. Talking safety is a free, fun, and interactive curriculum for middle schools and high schools and it has six 45 minute lessons. It teaches the NIOSH core competencies I mentioned earlier. It's customized for each US state and territory to reflect state specific child labor laws and resources. It's available in Spanish and it covers non-farm jobs. It has an online assessment tool and digital badge and it's also theory and evidence-based. Next slide, please. 
So at NIOSH, we have conducted a quasi-experimental study on the effectiveness, adoption, and implementation of the talking safety curriculum in the Miami-Dade Public School District, the fourth largest U.S. school district. Our study included eighth grade science, teachers, and students in the district, as well as numerous other partners, such as the superintendent and board of education, as are pictured on this slide. In terms of effectiveness outcomes after receiving the talking safety intervention, students in the study had significant increases in their workplace safety and health knowledge, attitude, self-efficacy, behavioral intention to enact safety and health skills on the job, and social norms. In terms of implementation outcomes, we found that there was a positive relationship between teacher implementation fidelity and student outcomes, such that teachers delivering the curriculum as it was designed had students with higher scores across all of the measures of interest. We also assessed various implementation strategies, including whether a direct training by the NIOSH research team or a train the trainer model was more effective. Our findings suggest that they were equally effective, which has important implications for the long-term sustainability of the program. Finally, we're picking back up after a hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic, completion of a summative evaluation report guided by a commonly used implementation science framework framework, the REAIM, or the REACH Effectiveness Adoption Implementation and Maintenance Framework. Next slide, please. So to see if our program could be transferred to and adapted for other settings, we conducted a four-year randomized controlled trial in the Oklahoma City Public Schools, the largest school district in Oklahoma. The research was conducted, uh, conducted pursuant to passage of Senate Bill 262, which I'd mentioned previously which was put forward by NIOSH partners and was signed into law on April 1st, 2015 by Governor Mary Fallon and calls for teaching of occupational safety and health education in schools using the talking safety curriculum. Results from this study are similar to what we've reported for the Miami-Dade Public Schools, which has important and exciting implications for the scale out of the program. We're also scaling out through the development and evaluation of an occupational safety and health training for adults in the workforce development sector. Next slide, please. So on this slide are just a few examples of what we've learned applying the REAIM framework mentioned previously to an evaluation of our five-year Miami-Dade study. For example, having champions was critical to the adoption of the program. Miami-Dade County requested our program because of the high number of injuries they were seeing from recent graduates at the high schools that were being employed by the county. The curriculum needed to be adapted with extensive input from the partners and stakeholders to meet the needs of the Miami-Dade Public Schools, teachers and students. The program, in other words, is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Implementation with fidelity, or as the program was designed and intended, covering the identified core components was also important. While outcomes were positive across the board, under-resourced communities did not perform as well as the schools with a lower percentage of students receiving free or reduced price lunch. We need to consider carefully who our programs are working for and how we can make our outcomes more equitable. And finally, although the teachers and students loved the program and it was integrated into the district pacing guide for eighth grade science, indicating a long-term commitment to and sustainability of the program, COVID-19 intervened. It's an important lesson that even the best designed programs won't succeed over the long term if the social environment doesn't support them. Next slide, please. So in summary, using implementation science techniques has been beneficial in implementing the talking safety curriculum in many different ways. It's helped us to consider more systematically what's important for implementation in the local context, in this case, in large public school districts. It's helped us to identify strategies, in our case, different training strategies that support participating schools to implement with fidelity and sustain the program over the long term. It's helped us to identify measures that consider what works for whom and under what circumstances so that we understand how to make our research and interventions more equitable. And finally, it's helped us to prepare the program for future scale up and scale out. Next slide. And now I'll talk a little bit about what's next. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of future opportunities for implementation science to support NIOSH efforts to study how to bring our research into sustained practice. 
On this slide are some existing resources from the Translation Research Program at NIOSH to build capacity in this area, as well as ongoing and future activities of the Translation Research Workgroup I mentioned. These include, but are certainly not limited to, refining the definition and concept of implementation or translational research for NIOSH and describing how it can be operationalized and aligned with the broader implementation science community, seeking stakeholder feedback and engaging with external partners on this issue. Finally, revising and updating NIOSH resources, developing, delivering, and evaluating training, and building NIOSH capacity in implementation research. In conclusion, applications of translational research and implementation research more specifically hold promise for addressing the limited movement of proven occupational safety and health interventions into widespread and sustained real world practice. The end goal is to improve the current and future safety, health and well-being of working people and to enhance occupational health equity in an increasingly dynamic and complex global economy over the next 50 years of NIOSH and beyond. Final slide, please. And I would just like to end uh, with briefly acknowledging all of my collaborators, including the members of the NIOSH Translational Research Workgroup, um, as well as our external collaborators and members of the NIOSH Safe Skilled Ready Workforce Program. So with that, I will end, I will turn it back over to you, Paul. And I wanted to thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to the questions and discussions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I think you really set the stage for us and uh, really illustrated uh, what implementation science can be and do. Uh, our next speaker is Jay Collinette. Jay is a senior scientist with the Health Hazards Protection Branch at the Pittsburgh Mining Research Division of NIOSH. He has a BS degree in mining engineering from West Virginia University, an MS degree in industrial engineering from the University of Pittsburgh, and is a registered professional engineer in Pennsylvania. Jay was a principal investigator, team leader, and branch chief before assuming his current position as senior scientist. The primary focus of his career has been to conduct and lead laboratory and mine site research to identify and evaluate control technologies that reduce the respirable dust exposure of mine workers and to assist industry in preventing the development of lung disease. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jay. Thank you, Paul. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is called a continuous personal dust monitor. Um, next slide, please. The topics I'd like to cover is the CPDM development and how it's operated. Talk about a 2014 dust rule that was passed by the Mine Safety and Health Administration, which regulates uh, laws in the mining industry. And talk about finally the impact of the CPDM on compliance dust sampling results. Next, please. We'll talk about the development and operation. So the Secretary of Labor back in the 90s put together an advisory committee to look at ways to eliminate pneumoconiosis among coal mine workers. And in 1996, it issued a report to the Secretary of Labor. One of those recommendations, recommendation number eight shown here, talked, to the agent, talked about uh, MSHA working with agencies such as NIOSH to develop continuous monitors potentially for compliance activity. So NIOSH initiated a research goal to develop a compliance grade dust monitor that would provide an end of shift respirable dust concentration and also pro provide in shift dust exposure information to the miner and mine operator with the hopes that they could use that information in real time to prevent overexposures from occurring. Next slide, please. So as far as the development of the dust instrument. NIOSH is issued a contract in 1998 to a company called Ruprick and Potashnik RMP to develop. It had to be person wearable and a mass-based monitor for underground coal mining. NIOSH led the development of this instrument uh, with periodic consultation with a number of stakeholders, including Bituminous Coal Operators Association, United Mine Workers of America, National Mining Association, 
AMSHA, and of course, RNP, which was subsequently purchased by Thermo Fisher Scientific. And during uh, periodic meetings with these stakeholders, they provided input on the, the design of the instrument and test protocols and also reviewed publications. Next slide, please. And I've been talking about a continuous personal dust monitor, and that is uh, specified in the Code of Federal Regulations, and there are specific performance criteria that have to be met to be certified as a CPDM. The instrument that is currently certified is manufactured by Thermo Fisher Scientific, and it's called the PDM Model 3700 Personal Dust Monitor. So that's the difference between CPDM, which is in the regulations, and PDM, which is this specific model. Other manufacturers could also get an instrument certified as a CPDM that could be used for sampling, but this is the only one at this time. And it provides an average respirable dust concentration immediately at the end of the sampling shift. In addition, it provides continuous respirable dust monitoring with in-shift feedback to the miner. It records dust concentrations and key instrument operating parameters each minute. And this instrument was certified in 2014 by MSHA for um, use in explosive mine environments and by NIOSH for the CPDM performance criteria for use in underground coal mines. And this is the photo of the current instrument. You can see there's a display on the top. A Higgins dual cyclone operated at 2.2 liters per minute gives you the respirable fraction. The sampling inlet is clipped to the lapel of mine workers. Uh, the TEOM is the measurement technology. I'll talk about that in the next slide, and it can be released from the instrument. And then there's the control buttons. Next slide, please. So the measurement technology is this TEOM, which stands for Tapered Element Oscillating Microbalance. And if you look at the photo on the right, it's a hollow tube with a filter mounted on top. And they're both vibrating at a known frequency at the start of sampling. As dust-laden air is pulled through the filter, the, the uh, filter captures the dust, and then that changes the frequency of vibration in direct relationship to the amount of mass that's being added to the filter. So that's the principle. And one good thing about this is it does not respond to particle characteristics such as optical properties or size distribution, which can impact other real-time uh, sampling methodologies such as light scattering. And this is the uh, TEOM module and the other photos with the filter mounted on top. And the TEOM and the internal air circuit are both heated to dry moisture from the sample. Next slide, please. The feedback that's provided to the miners on that display that I showed earlier. And there's multiple screens that they could look at. The first screen shown on top shows the last 30 minute running average concentration. And it also shows the cumulative shift exposure from the beginning of sampling to that point in the shift. If you scroll to the second screen, it shows the respirable dust limit, which defaults to 1.5. And I'll talk about that later. Um, however, if your dust uh, limit is lower based on excessive silica in the sample, the operator can put that in here when they're programming the unit for the operating shift. The next line is the percent of limit that's reached. And this is important uh, because if you're sampling for two hours out of a 10 hour shift and it says you're at 42% of your limit, you know you're on your way to an overexposure and hopefully you can make changes in operating practices or control technologies to prevent that overexposure from occurring. If you scroll to the third screen, it shows a bar chart with each bar representing a 30 minute average concentration and the lowest and highest uh, levels are shown on here. Uh, this along with, next screen, next slide please with the recorded information can be used to identify areas of high exposure. The PDM records two uh, dust files. One has this checksum validation. That's the compliance file that's transmitted to MSHA. It cannot be altered. The second file is a CSV file, which can be downloaded and analyzed by the mine operator. 
The graph here shows an example of that. This is uh, taken from uh, some testing we were doing in our full-scale long wall dust gallery, where you can see the cumulative concentration shown in blue and the 30 minute concentration in orange. And we were testing water spray systems at this time. And you could see obviously the first spray system that we tested was much better than the next two. And these could represent cuts in a mine and the mine operator could look at the differences between these to try to figure out why um, there were higher exposures in the, uh, the last two cuts. Next slide, please. I mentioned the PDM also monitors key operating parameters. Here's an example of three of those that are being monitored. And they each have defined ranges in the firmware in the instrument. And, um, if any parameter goes out of their defined range, what's called a status code is generated. There'll be a file printed at the end when they download the data as shown here. There's also a flashing S that appears on the screen to let the wearer know that one of the parameters has been uh, out of the defined range. MSHA uses a number of these to help determine the validity of the sample. And um, those codes are listed at this uh, website shown at the bottom. Next slide, please. And I'll talk about the new MSHA dust, relatively new MSHA dust rule. Next slide, please. It was passed, uh, or actually published May 1st, 2014 in the Federal Register with most of the changes that are required in the rule taking effect on August 1st, 2014. Two of the big changes, um, it went from eight hour sampling under the old dust rule to full shift sampling since most mines these days are operating nine, 10, 12 hour shifts. And also changed the amount of production that had to be achieved during sampling for the sample to be co considered valid. It went from 50% from the previous sampling period to 80% over the last 30 production shifts. So that's a big change. It required on February 1st for the CPDM to be used at underground coal mines. It's optional at surface mines. And on August 1st, the dust standard was reduced to 1.5 milligrams per cubic meter from the old standard of 2.0. Next slide, please. So how do mine operators use this? They're required to conduct quarterly sampling for what's called the designated occupation and other designated occupation. From historic dust sampling data, MSHA knows the occupations that have uh, potential for the highest exposure, and these are defined in the regulation now. And for continuous mining operations, it's the continuous miner and roof bolter operators that are the DO and ODO. And for the long walls, it's tailgate side shear operator and jack setters. They have to do uh, consecutive sampling every shift until 15 valid samples are obtained for both DO and ODO. However, they cannot be sampled concurrently. So that means they're sampling a minimum of 30 consecutive shifts. The photo in the center shows the gravimetric sampler that was historically used by mine operators and it's still being used by MSHA. That's primarily because the filter can be analyzed for silica content where the filter in the PDM cannot. Next slide, please. So the impact that the CPDM has had on compliance. Next slide. MSHA lists their compliance sampling data on their website that's shown at the bottom of this graph here. And we downloaded this data and looked at the five-year period before any of the dust roll was implemented and the five-year period after all phases of the dust rule were implemented. So we're comparing, this is for MSHA inspector samples, gravimetric, uh, concent gravimetric sampler at 2.0 versus gravimetric sampler at 1.5. You could see for the CM operator, there was a drop in the percent of samples that exceeded the standard. However, for the other three occup occupations, there was an increase of overexposures by 15 to 73%. Next slide, please. That's not totally surprising given the standard was lowered. And as I mentioned, they're required to sample full shift and with higher production levels. And that's what this graph shows. Um, you can see for the continuous minor operations about a 200 
ton per shift and 85 minute per shift increase, even more dramatic on long walls, 3,500 tons per shift approximately in over 105 minutes additional sampling time. Next slide, please. However, if you look at the operator samples from that same data set, the green shows the gravimetric in 2.0, the orange is with the CPDM at the 1.5 standard. You can see a dramatic reduction between 63 and 86% in the percent of samples that exceeded the standard. And those are under the same conditions, the reduced dust standard, increased sampling time and increased production. So a dramatic change from what the MSHA inspector samples show using the old dust sampler. Next slide, please. So we, this suggests that the mine workers are using it the way we had hoped. And a former colleague, Emily Haas, actually visited six mines and interviewed 35 miners that were wearing the CPDM, primarily the DO and ODO. This information was published in a journal article. Next slide, please. And from that, I just pulled a few of the positive comments. Um, one of the miners said they liked looking at the readout. It can prevent overexposure later. It changes your habits, keeps it more on your mind and made us more aware when we look out for each other. The main negative comments were focused on size and weight of the unit. Next slide, please. So finally, this is actual uh, dust concentrations for these four occupations over those time periods. And you can see that dust levels have dropped almost in every case. And we feel that the CPDM based on the information I provided before um, contributed significantly to this uh, improvement in dust exposure. Next slide. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Great, thank you, Jay. Thanks for a great example of an intervention that clearly is going to make a difference. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ted Teske. Uh, Theodore Teske is a health communication specialist for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health Western States Division. He has worked for NIOSH since 1999, developing practical, relevant interventions for the commercial fishing industry, mining, oil, and gas in the aviation industries. His research is focused on improving the process of bringing NIOSH research into practice, including conducting health communication and research translation projects, which with focuses on occupational culture, social marketing, and technology transfer. Ted received his BA and MA from Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washer. Ted, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. So, Thank you all for attending today and uh, spending some time to learn about Live to be Salty, a research translation project designed to improve personal flotation device use among commercial fishermen in Alaska. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get too far into the campaign part, I want to give a little background about uh, safety in commercial fishing. And, and when we look at fatalities by incident type in commercial fishing, we see that roughly half of them are from vessel disasters where the boat sinks and, and the fishermen end up in the water. Uh, but that second category there is falls overboard, and that's 30% roughly of the fatalities. And uh, when we look at the incidents here from 2000 to 2018, we can see that not a single victim was wearing a personal flotation device or a PFD when they drown. And so that uh, tells us something pretty significant that, you know, the fishermen that are wearing PFDs aren't dying from falls overboard or nobody's wearing PFDs. And as we looked at uh, the industry and talked to our partners, it seemed to be that latter case that fishermen just didn't wear them. Uh, next slide, please. After presenting this data at a fishing safety advisory council meeting, uh, we did have a fisherman ask, why doesn't someone just give a bunch of PFDs to fishermen and see what they like? And so that's what we did. Uh, we conducted a survey uh, with 400 fishermen up in Alaska in 2008, 2009, uh, to look at their attitudes, beliefs, and opinions about the risks of falls overboard and their use of personal flotation devices. That study also included a, an evaluation of uh, six different PFD types. We handed those out to 200 fishermen roughly, uh, where they were gonna look at uh, what they thought of the PFD after one day, and then give us another survey, another evaluation for 30 days to see if over time, you know, they could get used to wearing it. And um, that uh, study actually showed us that there were fishery specific preferences in PFD style, 
and fishery specific barriers to PFD use, meaning that gill netters like different things than long liners and trawlers like different things than crabbers. Um, but what it also really showed us was that there was at least one PFD model on the market uh, that each group of fishermen rated as appropriate and comfortable for their type of fishing. Next slide, please. Some other, uh, another interesting finding from that study was this gap between perceived PFD effectiveness and PFD use. When we asked them in the survey if PFDs were effective at preventing fatalities from falls overboard, a vast majority of the surveyed fishermen said that they were fairly or very effective, but only a third of those same respondents said they used PFDs with any regularity. So, you know, in their head, they knew that they were effective, but when, they, when it came to using them on deck, they would never would. Um, and now there is no regulation requiring PFD use in commercial fishing. And so, um, you know, they have to make the choice to do it. And there were barriers in that in the way. And that, that's what we wanted to address with the study and, uh, and move on from there. So um, next slide, please. Our initial worker focused output um, was a series of gear specific fact sheets, right? Since we saw that variation uh, in preference based on the type of fishing the guys were doing, we developed a fact sheet for each one of our, uh, our different study groups and summarized the, the PFDU survey and evaluation data. And we also included narrative examples from the study participants that uh, basically were you know, peer reviews. You know, like what, did, what did they think about this particular vest and what worked for them as a, as a crab fisherman or as a longliner? Um, we then added uh, to this series of four sheets, we added one more that was an overview sheet kind of talking about the, the general differences between the different types of PFDs, whether they were foam or uh, you know, inherent flotation or inflatable vests. Um, next slide, please. But we wanted to do something that was a little more targeted. Uh, you know, we handed those, those fact sheets out at trade shows and they were available online and we uh, distributed them through our partners to give out at training sessions. But we wanted something that would uh, be more targeted to the fishermen individually and uh, get into their common media consumption channels. And so something that would speak to them on a peer level and have some authenticity with an attention grabbing message that the fact sheets didn't really have. And so, um, we wanted them to be able to interact with these messages at the area at the time and the place where they were making their decisions about what they were going to wear during uh, their upcoming fishing season. And so as we thought about all those different types of ideas. We thought that the concept of social marketing was going to provide a strong method for creating appropriate and impactful messaging that could move fishermen towards the adoption of uh, wearing PFDs when they were working. Next slide, please. And one big thing we wanted to incorporate in all of this messaging was um, the idea of occupational culture. So this would gonna make the messages more credible and, uh, and less likely to be dismissed by our target audiences. Through past work on training development in mining and oil and gas extraction, we've come to understand that every occupation, uh, but especially high risk occupations, have a collection of norms and standards that the members abide by. And this is usually summed up as, as you see here, the way we do things around here. And these cultural cues are used to separate the group members from outsiders, right? And these can include things like your vocabulary and the, the terms you use to talk about your work, the way you dress for work, um, and uh, the decision-making processes that you go through when conducting your work. High-risk occupations can have especially insular cultures, right, that, that really eschew advice or input from outsiders because of that risk that they all share. You know, if you don't share that risk with them and they don't think you have the right perspective potentially to, to speak uh, credibly to what they go through. So it's critical that our messages conform to and work within the norms of the occupational culture of commercial fishermen. Next slide, please. Towards that end, we uh, put out a contract with a strategic communication firm to help us put these messages together and, and create some concepts that could you know, have that um, memorable and quotable type of aspect we wanted. And so the one that was their favorite and ours too is, was called Salty and, and it had to be called Live to be Salty. And it featured a culturally relevant spokesman that would look, talk, and act like our audience. And the main point was to make him memorable, quotable, and different. So when they saw the ads, when they saw the messages, it would, it would jar them out of their usual media consumption habits and catch their attention quickly. Now, the first pass that we see here on the screen had some deficiencies based on what we knew about the occupational culture of Alaskan fishermen. Uh, first off, uh, you know, he was named Angus McGilly, and so we changed that name to Angus Iverson to reflect the more Scandinavian culture of a lot of Northwest fishermen. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we uh, change the type of vessel that would match the kinds of vessels that our target audiences work on. Uh, a commercial fisherman looking at this picture would know that this is not a, a gillnet vessel, a salmon gillnet vessel, or a crab vessel up in the Bering Sea. This is more of an East Coast type of vessel. Uh, the cigar that he's uh, chomping on there was, was probably not going to be something that would be appropriate for a CDC safety campaign. 
But from a social marketing perspective, the most critical component that was missing was he's not wearing a PFD. He's not exhibiting the behavior you want your audience to, uh, to, to pick up and start using. So uh, Angus needed a makeover. Next slide, please. We went to Seattle and, uh, and shot some new imagery uh, with uh, a local actor. And uh, we actually got on a gill netter. We got on a crab vessel and up into the wheelhouse of the crab vessel so that we could start getting our visuals to match what our, uh, our audience was gonna be used to seeing and working around. Next slide, please. And so you can see the revised image here now. Angus is you know, standing on the deck of a crab boat there um, with the, the harbor in the background. He's wearing the rain gear that the guys wear and he's got his PFD on. And uh, the PFDs were actually provided by some partners of ours. Um, I asked for, for you know, well-worn PFDs and they did not disappoint. They brought uh, right off the boat, still wet and covered in fish guts. So it's about as authentic as it gets. Uh, next slide, please. So something else we had to do was uh, match the, uh, the copy with our audience expectations. So we had the look, but now we had to have the words right. And so these were two of the original concepts that we had. Um, and we took these out for some, some focus group testing. And uh, they actually, the, you know, the results came back. They said they would really prefer to have Angus clean up his language, which is not something that you typically would think of when considering the speaking habits of commercial fishermen. Um, but we did. So next slide, please. We ended up revising our copy and, uh, and tuning it a little more to their preferences and came up with a series of 12 posters, you know, 12 different messages. And some of them were tuned towards the crab boats. Some were tuned towards the gillnet vessels and some were geared towards uh, targeting the skippers up in, uh, up in the wheelhouse who, even though there's no regulation that guys have to wear life jackets, skippers can set a policy on the vessel that says you have to wear a life jacket when working on the boat. And so we want to have that message targeted to them as well. Next slide, please. So with all these messages in hand, it was time to go uh, implement and then evaluate Angus out in the wild. Next slide, please. So in addition to the posters, we developed a series of materials that could be used in locations frequented by our audiences prior to the start of their season. They would all gather in either Dutch Harbor, Alaska for the crabbers or Naknek, Alaska for the, the salmon gillnet fishermen. And uh, we would get these uh, pieces in there um, gear shops and, and have them available for them to see when they arrived. And we would work with the vendors to get these materials out there. And we'd also provide workshops for the workers in these um, gear shops so they could speak to the study results that we had and, and talk about why these PFDs would work for these specific fishermen. So the next thing we did was evaluate on this slide here. Uh, in 2014 and 2015, researchers from our office conducted pre-season surveys with 100 fishermen from each of our target audiences. So we could track both the recognition and recall of Angus and, and his message over time. Uh, these surveys also track any increase in PFD use and changes in PFD attitude um, by using questions from the original 2008-2009 survey that we conducted. So we wanted to separate you know, any change in attitude you know, that just happened organically over time you know, compared to the change that happened as due to exposure to our messaging. Next slide, please. As we were out walking around and uh, conducting our surveys, we were, we're getting feedback anecdotally as well from the fishermen. Uh, and you can read some of these quotes here and they might sound a little harsh uh, at first glance, but actually this is a good sign because it shows that they recognize Angus, but they didn't dismiss him. You know, they were treating him like another fisherman or kind of giving him a hard time and, and sort of um, interacting with him like you would see them interacting with other fishermen. So the, the credibility of the messenger seemed to be um, holding up over time. Next, message, or next slide, please. When we look at the quantitative data, uh, we can see that there was an increase in message awareness between year one and year two of our campaign uh, in both audiences, which is good. The, the really low number there in the first table in 2014 for the gillnet fishermen um, is associated with the fact that, that we had the campaign start in May and then we did our survey a month later in June, whereas that first year the crab fishermen had an extra five months till October of that year to be exposed to the messaging before we went and surveyed them. So that's why you had that jump there. Um, when we look at the second table, looking at the concept of Angus's authenticity, we can see that less than half the respondents agreed with the statement that the man in the picture here seems like me. But then three quarters of those people roughly did agree with the statement that they see that he seemed like a seasoned fisherman. And I think that has to do when we look at the demographics of our survey group, um, their average age was 35, 36 years old. So when they looked at Angus in the posters, you know, those guys didn't see themselves, but they did see a seasoned fisherman or, or a peer that they could trust. And that was uh, a good finding. Next slide, please. 
Looking at the most common channels uh, where people saw Angus and interacted with the messaging, uh, the magazine ads by far were the, the most um, common channel. And that was a series there, you can see on the right, a series of ads. Once a month, we had this ad, uh, one of the 12 posters we developed turned into a, an ad for a magazine. And those would get read, you know, in the wheelhouse or in the in the boatyard as the guys were working and get passed around to the groups. And so that was where they remember seeing Angus most likely. Now uh, the posters were second. So again, they were seeing those in the gear shops, they were seeing those um, in, the, in the restaurants and in the um, grocery stores around the harbors. Stickers were third. And when we do see our digital channel down there, the internet, you know, these posters did have a call to action to, you know, go online and look at our, our findings and get more information on our website. And we see that not a lot of folks remember seeing the information on the website. And I think that has to do with the ability at the time, you know, to actually get online in these harbors and you're, when you're out in remote Western Alaska, um, internet access is not always a, a, a very common or reliable thing. So uh, that what we saw um, lesson learned that our, this audience still prefers hard copy and, and responds well to hard copy um, channels. Next slide, please. And when we get to the end and look at the most common actions taken based on exposure to these messages, um, we can see that there was a range. You know, people were going to try on a PFD. They were going to look for more information on PFDs. You know, share these messages with other people, um, get a new PFD. But about a quarter of our respondents did end up saying they're going to wear their PFD more often, and that's really the ultimate goal: is to get these guys to stop considering life jackets as a, a piece of emergency equipment. You know, to wear when something goes wrong. We want them to wear them all the time, so that you know they have them on when they enter the water, and uh, and they're there to help. Uh, you know, keep them alive while they're while they're overboard. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we can see, you know, Angus was memorable. He was quotable. He was interruptive. You know, people recalled him and remembered his message. Um, you know, through our evaluation, we were able to uh, identify the popular channels used by this target audience. So that as we do more of these types of campaigns or have new hazards to talk about or uh, new fisheries to work with, we can consider those results as we as we target different channels. And the last thing was that, that subcultural norms required some special attention. So, you know, we, we talked about paying attention to occupational culture, but as you're doing audience segmentation, we learned that there's even differences, you know, even commercial fishermen have subgroups within them, right? And so we found in this case that the gill netters didn't respond, I don't think, quite as well to Angus uh, as the crab fishermen did. Uh, and, you know, as they were looking at a, a photo of Angus, you know, they thought his hair was, was too well combed and they, they thought that, you know, wearing a flannel shirt was not a good idea. You know, most guys wear fleece nowadays. Um, and so there, there were little things about his appearance that you got to pay attention to because that can, you know, can basically erode the credibility of your, of your message and messenger with the audience. And with that, so next slide, please. I will thank you for your time and turn it back over to Paul. Thank you, uh, Ted. That was great. Uh, what a comprehensive approach. Uh, let's go to our next speaker, Scott Ernest. Scott is the Associate Director for Construction Safety and Health at NIOSH. Prior to joining the Office of Construction Safety and Health, Scott was Engineering Branch Chief in the uh, Division of Applied Research and Technology from 2005 to 2015. Scott has over 70 peer-reviewed publications and technical reports. He began his career as an active duty commissioned officer in the US Army Corps of Engineers. He is a registered professional engineer and a certified safety professional with an MS and PhD degrees in industrial and mechanical engineering. Scott, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'm um, looking forward to talking about uh, the OSHA silica standard and how uh, NIOSH's research supported that. Um, really, the research that's been done at NIOSH has been extensive when it comes to silica. It's gone on for many years. It's touched on topics such as surveillance, air sampling, toxicology, exposure assessment, engineering controls and risk assessment. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is focused on the engineering control research. There's about 2.3 million workers in the US who are exposed to respiral crystalline silica, and many of them work in the construction industry. There's over 850,000 of these workers that were estimated to be exposed to silica levels that exceeded the OSHA PEL. Next slide. NIOSH began state-based surveillance to diagnose and track silicosis going all the way back to 1987. NIOSH provided technical support and subject matter expertise to NIOSH-funded state-level silicosis programs. Through these state partnerships, New Jersey discovered that silicosis was occurring among heavy and highway construction workers and identified a number of high-exposure tasks. 
Both New Jersey and Michigan track hospital and emergency department discharges to identify and track silicosis cases. From 2003 to 2011, both states identified and confirmed 292 cases of silicosis in that population. Next slide. There's also been a lot of work done on air sampling methods. For compliance purposes, it's important that sampling and analytical methods can accurately measure worker exposures. NIOSH conducted, conducted extensive research to develop respiratory crispin silica methods at very low levels. A 2012 ASTM technical symposium was chaired by NIOSH staff and focused on air sampling methods for measurement of silica and respiral mineral particles. The ASTM technical symposium addressed issues such as exposure levels, bulk materials used, analysis, sampler differences, measurement precision, high flow sampler rates, and laboratory proficiency. Presentations at the symposium concluded that respiratory crystalline silica can be accurately measured using analytical techniques that employ appropriate calibration and quality control. The conference proceedings supported a lower level for the OSHA PEL for silica. Next slide. Now the next several slides are based on work that were done in the engineering and physical hazards branch um, in Cincinnati. NIOSH and stakeholders identified the need to control silica dust exposures during pavement milling and highway construction. This work built upon previously successful asphalt paving research um, done in the same group. A silica asphalt milling machine partnership was formed to study milling machine dust controls. This partnership included all manufacturers of pavement milling machines sold in the US. There was nearly a decade of research with 15 technical reports on controlling silica dust from milling machines. And as a result of this research, all US and foreign manufacturers of heavy construction equipment to sell pavement milling machines to in the US market agreed to install silica dust controls on all their new milling, milling machines in January of 2017. Some of the partners that were involved in this, in addition to the manufacturers, the National Asphalt Paving Association, the Federal Highway Administration, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, the laborers, and the operating engineers. Next slide. In addition to the technical reports, there were several documents that were produced by NIOSH and the Silica Asphalt Milling Machine Partnership. The top document on the top right contains best practices for equipment manufacturers, equipment owners, and contractors to reduce silica exposures during milling. This is a very highly technical document. The document recommends uh, recommendations include ventilation controls on all new half lane and larger asphalt milling machines, and also retrofitting wet water sprays if ventilation dust controls are not available. And then the, doc, the green document was developed by CPWR and is a field guide, which has a much more, much briefer and has a much more applied approach. Next slide. There was all, also a lot of work done on jackhammers. NIOSH evaluated the use of jackhammers for breaking concrete pavement and examined engineering controls to reduce worker exposures to dust. Three different controls were evaluated as part of, of the jackhammer study. Study results showed that the control devices reduced exposures to dust from jackhammer operations and other workers near the work area. In each case, the percentage reduction was significant. Overall, the use of water spray was the most effective at around 74%. Next slide. Additional work was done in this area and it was shown that water sprays could reduce as high as up to 77% when uh, properly designed and applied. Next slide. A number of the outputs that came out of this research include um, a published case study, a workplace solutions document, and a how-to guide that was developed by the New Jersey laborers. Next slide. There was also a lot of work done related to um, stone countertops. Uh, based upon the work, Ocean NIOSH issued a hazard alert on worker silica exposures during the manufacturing, the finishing, and the installation of stone countertops. The alert discusses 46 workers in Spain, and 25 in Israel that developed silicosis from exposure to silica from the manufacturing of stone countertops. 10 of the workers in Israel required lung transplants as a result of their condition from the work. OSHA and NIOSH discussed the health hazards of workers involved in stone countertop fabrication and during in-home finishing and installation. The, the alert explains how to mitigate the hazard using the appropriate dust controls. Next slide. NIOSH also worked on cutting fiber cement siding in silica exposures. 
the use of fiber cement siding in construction and renovation has undergone rapid growth. Between 1991 and 2010, the market share of fiber cement siding increased from 1% to 13% of the market. In contrast, the market share of wood siding in residential construction fell from about 38% down to 8%. Construction workers may be exposed to silica when cutting fiber cement siding. Fiber cement products contain as much as 50% crystalline silica, and cutting this material with a power saw can cause excessive exposures to respirable crystalline silica. NIOSH found that workers' exposures could be reduced by attaching a regular shop vac to a dust collecting circular saw to provide a low cost solution. Next slide. Construction workers are also exposed to hazardous dust containing respirable crystalline silica while operating dowel drilling machines to drill horizontal holes in concrete pavement. Dowel drilling is performed during concrete airport runway construction and highway construction when a lane is added or during full depth repair on concrete runways and highways to provide load transfers across traverse pavement joints. NIOSH found that exposures were reduced using tool mounted local exhaust ventilation and good work practices. Next slide. This slide shows OSHA ta OSHA's table one in the silica standard. Much of the NIOSH engineer control research was included in the table one of the silica standard that was published in 2016. This is a complete list of table one entries that heavily rely on the NIOSH as well as CPR, CPWR data for controls that limit exposure levels at or below the permissible exposure limit. This table covers many different construction tasks that involve exposure to, to RCS. Next slide. Table one includes 18 tasks with dust controls and in some case respirator requirements. Employers that fully implement table one do not have to comply with the PEL or conduct exposure assessments. So because of that, it's very popular. And actually, uh, currently, there's work ongoing to expand table one to include additional tasks beyond the initial 18, um, beyond the initial 18 tasks. Next slide. The impact of this research is thousands of new pieces of equipment that are on the market with dust control technologies. This slide shows a couple images from, from several uh, major tool manufacturers. DeWalt and Makita. Ultimately, use of the hand tools equipped with control technology is expected to reduce the cases of silicosis and save lives. In OSHA's final rule for occupational exposure to RCS, they estimated an annualized benefits of nearly $9 billion, saving over 600 lives and preventing more than 900 new cases of silicosis each year. Next slide. CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training, developed the Silica Safe website for use in the construction industry. That was developed in collaboration with the Research to Practice Work Group and also had support from labor and management of industry stakeholders. The website reflects CPWR, NIOSH, and other research findings translated into tools, materials, and other information for targeted audiences, such as workers and contractors who can use the information on job sites to reduce exposures. There have been tens of thousands of materials downloaded from this website since its inception. The Silica Safe website contents and planning tools were referenced in the Silica Stakeholder Testimony to OSHA and during post-hearing briefings. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. That was marvelous. And what a, uh, a comprehensive approach that utilized a lot of collaborations. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee is a senior research scientist at Marshfield Clinic Research Institute in Marshfield, Wisconsin. She has directed the NIOSH-funded National Children's Center for Rural and Agricultural Health and Safety since uh, establishment in 1997, and has dedicated the majority of her career to advocating for the protection of children who are exposed to agricultural hazards. She is the past co-chair of the NORA Agricultural Forestry and Fishing Sector Council, past president of the International Society for Agricultural Safety and Health. And in 2007, she co-founded the Agricultural Safety and Health Council of America, an agribusiness-led non-government organization based in Washington, DC. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in the 50th anniversary webinar. 
My presentation today will provide a very brief overview of the National Initiative to Prevent Childhood Agricultural Injuries that was launched back in 1996. We'll review the background and key accomplishments to date, along with continued challenges and some future areas for focus. Um, next slide, there you go. In 1987, Cheryl Tevis, a reporter for Successful Farming Magazine, sent shockwaves into the farming community with her landmark story, an eight page insert that included headshots of victims and details about their traumatic deaths. It took a while to get estimates on the scope of the problem, but Dr. Fred Rivera, University of Washington Harborview, published the fatality estimates at 300 a year, and then Ted Miller of the Pacific Research Institute generated the first estimates of non-fatal injuries at about 300,000 a year. In 1987, with a new position at the National Farm Medicine Center, uh, next slide, I began clipping and saving every news report I could find each time feeling queasy and frustrated over the frequency and consistency of these events. It was evident they were not freak accidents, but predictable and preventable events. Next slide. So what were the gaps and what was needed? 25 years ago, there was a lack of data. There were limited youth work standards. It seemed that cultural norms in farming communities accepted child deaths as God's will or freak accidents. And uh, there were only a few, there were no responsible federal or state agencies handling this topic, and there were only a few relevant safe farm safety resources. In addition, there was this assumption that we call the farm kid paradox, where it was thought the benefits of living and working on a farm outweigh the risks. So what was uh, what seemed obvious was that we needed data and the you know the injury prevention ease of engineering, education, and enforcement along with an understanding of how to mobilize knowledge and safety interventions for this rural and sometimes hard to reach population. Next slide. So with Kellogg Foundation funding, Marshfield hosted a three-day event with Dr. Donald Millar, the director of NIOSH, giving the keynote address. The report that was generated from the symposium exposed the problem from multiple perspectives and justified further action. So over a two-year period, a national action plan for leadership, surveillance, research, education, and enforcement was developed and endorsed in principle by 80 organizations. A group of us met with then NIOSH director, Dr. Linda Rosenstock. She agreed that NIOSH could be the lead agency on the condition that we got the money for it. So we went to work and Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa introduced the National Action Plan into the congressional record and Congressman Dave Obie of Wisconsin facilitated appropriations to NIOSH at $15 million a year. So by 1996, NIOSH officially launched this initiative with intramural and extramural funding plus a federal advisory group. Next slide. This graph depicts the overall decline in non-fatal injuries from 2001 until 2014, which is the last year that surveillance was conducted by NIOSH, and they had been working with the National Egg Statistics Service. The green line reflects children living on farms, while red is the total of all children. We learned that on average, every day, about 33 children are injured in a farm-related incident, and we also learned that about more than 60% of these kids who were being injured were not working at the time. So we really had to shift some of the focus of our work. We also, other research uh, revealed that the economic toll of the injuries and deaths was greater than $1 billion a year. Uh, next slide. So this graph depicts fatality rates as tracked via the Bureau of Labor Statistics for youth ages 15 to 17. Thus, it captures only a portion of childhood fatalities, since many occur to non-working youth or those younger than 15 years. And even with these data, you see that youth working in agriculture are at least eight times more likely to die at work than their non-agriculture counterparts. And a look at agents of injuries showed us that among young youth working and non-working children, tractors account for about 50% of the deaths. Research also revealed that nearly all the non-working child fatalities are reported as supervised, meaning an adult was present in a work environment with a child. 
Next slide. So now I would like to describe a few major outputs of the in initiative. In 2015, NIOSH discontinued their child aid injury surveillance efforts due to rising costs and declining injuries. So our center responded by developing a new database. Egg Injury News was initially launched in 2015 and has been growing ever since. It is a free online up-to-date resource of publicly available news. Users include a mix of researchers, educators, reporters, and government agencies, such as the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Egg Injury News now includes adult farm injuries and is expanding to include international data. The database is a service and a rich resource for media reports, data mining, and intervention studies. But in the future, additional funds will be needed to sustain this valuable resource. Next slide. In our early years, the center focus was on developing voluntary guidelines for work, play, agritourism, media relations, and childcare. Guidelines were drafted and refined via consensus development processes with many collaborators. And regarding research from 1998 to 2007, NIOSH had a specific funding stream for extramural grants on childhood egg safety. Of the total projects funded, and I think it was in the neighborhood of about 35 R01s, 13 of these were unique studies conducted to validate the voluntary work guidelines and evaluate implementation strategies for their use by farm parents. Next, a valuable aspect of a NIOSH funded center such as ours is the option to allocate funds for external projects. With a peer reviewed mechanism, our mini grant program annually funded three to four projects. And this slide describes some of the mini grant program features that has now trans transitioned to an emerging issues program uh, this year with a, a focus on COVID-19. Regarding training, our center working with various collaborating organizations and the regional NIOSH egg centers offers multi-day workshops across the US to build capacity in childhood agricultural safety and health. Workshops have been in person, all virtu virtual and or sometimes a hybrid model. Um, next, our center launched the Child Egg Safety Network more than two decades ago. Uh, we have coordinated communications and activities for this loose-knit coalition of safety advocates, including farm safety professionals, farm and youth serving organizations, healthcare providers, insurance agencies, and the farm media. The network serves as a vehicle to develop and disseminate public service campaign messages on topics like keep kids away from tractors, and I'm a parent first, I'm a farmer second. And currently the Child Egg Safety Network is working on an ATV safety campaign. In 2015, our center reset all projects to be based on the socio-ecologic model, which we adapted for childhood agricultural injury prevention. Over the years, our work has transitioned from a focus on parents to the model's outer layers of uh, agribusinesses, farm organizations, and uh, insurance providers. Our outreach engages groups like these, such as uh, insurance carriers, farm cooperatives and policymakers. Currently in one of our projects, we are assessing legal cases where a parent is prosecuted for negligent behavior resulting in a child's death on a farm. We've, we know that social and community acceptance of childhood trauma reveals a wide discrepancy between rural and urban perspectives. And this includes responses by district attorneys and child protective service agencies in how cases are handled. Our focus on influencing public policy is now a standing agenda for our center's leadership meetings. Now I'm gonna share some good news about impacts. Over these past 25 years, there have been many accomplishments. The Child Egg Safety Network has grown from 10 to 18 organizations. Data reveal a 60% decline in non-fatal injuries from 2001 to 2014 although we don't really have uh, any data to inform trends in the past six years. And a 2011 MMWR report com commented on the Child Aid Initiative within the Occupational Safety Top 10 Successes of the Decade. 
And then regarding funding beyond NIOSH, there have been some small USDA grants, mostly for tractor safety training. And there's been corporate sponsorship of several non-government uh, non organizations. And very importantly, NIOSH funded research using a case control study revealed that childhood agricultural injuries on family farms were cut in half when the NAGCAT work guidelines were used. A few more impacts are that um, include the establishment of the child egg injury database, which has been funded in part through our NIOSH Children's Center. It's an important data set in the absence of a national surveillance system. Also, the initial 1996 action plan has been subjected to three updates with reviews by many peers. Recommendations have evolved over time from basic to applied translational research and from education to policy relevant actions. And our center will lead a project to generate and disseminate an updated action plan in the year uh, 2025. So we've come a long way in safeguarding uh, children from agricultural hazards. Um, next slide. Uh, but from my vantage point, several gaps and challenges remain. These include valid, reliable injury data, difficulty reaching certain populations, increased use of small motorized vehicles and machinery on farms, the unstable farm economy, and childcare issues. Some of these challenges can be addressed in the short term, and we're really keen to see an extra boost of support from uh, President Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure investment and Jobs Act bill that will augment the rural economy. And if the future social infrastructure bill becomes a reality, it would target childcare shortages. However, other, other challenges such as updating the child labor and agriculture regulations will require total buy-in from major farm organizations and they may never materialize. So what does the future hold? Our 25 year collective experience suggests these areas of emphasis. Data on child egg injuries and fatalities are needed at given intervals to reset our priorities. Research should generate evidence of what motivates or doesn't uh, parents and responsible adults to protect working and non-working children on farms where safety standards are not enforced. The socio-ecologic model guides our efforts to engage influential organizations and leaders in modeling safety protocols for children. And educational programming with public and private sector funding should focus on young parents and beginning farmers to establish rules and protocols that challenge unsafe traditions. We want to support and guide public defenders and child protection agencies in holding farm parents to the same standards expected in cases of negligent behavior. That is when non-working children are injured or killed in, an, in a dangerous occupational setting. And childcare, affordable, accessible, high quality is desperately needed for family farmers and hired farm workers. And we believe the low hanging fruit in eliminating farm related uh, disease and injuries on children is to remove non-working children from the active farm operations. So at my home base, we are fortunate to have a robust, talented team of scientists, research and communication specialists and many support staff. Plus, we have strong affiliations with the regional NIOSH Egg Centers and our, and our NIOSH Egg Program leader, Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. And we encourage you to contact our staff at any time for information and review we, our websites. The National Children's Site describes our research projects and the scientists, while the Cultivate Safety website is for the public act to access many valuable resources, as well as a link to the Egg Injury News database. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to tell this story about children, agriculture, safety and health, national collaborations, and several notable accomplishments. There's still more work to do, and we appreciate NIOSH's strong commitment to raising our next generation, many of whom will carry on the work of producing the food, fiber, and fuel that keeps us going. So with that, I'll hand it back to Paul. Thank you, Barbara, for such a wonderful presentation for many years of good work and for particularly uh, portraying the socio-ecological uh, model, which I think uh, will be a driver for thinking about how we do translation science. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? 
We're now gonna go on to questions and answers. Uh, and uh, in the question session, please put any questions in the Q&A box. If we run out of time and you want to, to get further information, you can email any of our speakers at these addresses. Uh, and so I'll go to the Q&A box right off. And we did have one question there for, uh, for Jay. Can the PDM model 3700 work in general industry? If it works, any, have any studies been conducted? I would say yes, it could uh, be used in general industry. Probably the biggest hindrance may be the size. As I mentioned, that was the, the most common complaint. The sampler weighs about 4.4 pounds and it's uh, nine and a half inches wide by six and three quarters inches high and three and a quarter inches deep. So that was the biggest complaint. In response to that, NIOSH does have a contract with Thermo Fisher Scientific, an ongoing contract to develop the next generation sampler. Um, the goal is to reduce the weight by 35% and the volume by 50% and update the electronics that are used. However, the uh, pandemic um, has delayed progress on that contract and we've recently extended it. Okay, great, thanks, Jay. Here's a question for Rebecca. Very interesting summary of NIOSH's talking safety curriculum. While it's important and useful to understand the short-term effects of uh, the program for students, wouldn't the true DNI test of the training's real-world effectiveness include assessing its impact on young worker injury, illness, and disability rates in actual work sites? Has this been done, or is there a plan for this? Hi, Paul. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, yes, that's very important for establishing the long-term evidence base of the program. So. Our initial research was really um, has been designed to establish just the effectiveness of the curriculum in the classroom for younger students. So our, our target was eighth grade students, so they're not integrated yet into the workforce. Uh, we now have a larger research study in the same district in Miami-Dade. We're work, working in the high schools with the career and technical education students. So they're actually in workplaces um, as part of their training in CTE. Um, and so we'll have an opportunity to collect some of that data, albeit from a smaller sample. Um, this work has been on pause due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, we're up and running again. So hopefully we'll have some results from that as we go forward. Um, we also have some opportunities to partner with some international um, organizations who are doing some of this work based on our research, um, who are working in um, some of the apprenticeship programs. Um, so we've been working with uh, our partners in, in Finland, as well as in Denmark on some interventions to, to test some of this. So it's very important. Um, we consider um, our research is really uh, in its infancy is in some ways, and this will be really important for establishing the long-term impact of our program. Thanks for the question. Okay, great. I really want to, we're, we're essentially out of time. So I really want to thank all of our speakers for marvelous portrayal of how uh, NIOSH can move its research to practice and the kind of research that will be needed to do that, the generalizable research as well as the intervention specific research. So thank you for all that. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, this concludes uh, the series of webinars for the celebration of NIOSH's 50th anniversary. Uh, all of the uh, 50th anniversary activities can be seen, including our past webinars at this web website, which can be found on the NIOSH uh, 50th uh, anniversary uh, page. And from the, in the next slide, this is another obligatory disclaimer about mention of products uh, and company names. So with that, I again, thanks to all the speakers. Thank to you for your attention and your interest. And it's a pleasure to be part of an organization that works to keep workers safe and healthy. Thank you. <laughs>